Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatorial Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce today the Judrat Pumuru from uh, Isaac Pune. And he's going to talk about uh, generating functions for the powers in GLN Q. Hey, Judrat, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, sir, for uh, introducing me and uh, giving me an opportunity to talk in this. Uh, uh, seminar series that is going on. So I hope everyone can see my uh, screen. Um, yes. So yeah. So uh, so I will start with the so the title of the talk is uh, generating functions for the powers in GLNQ. So I will uh, make sense of what I mean by powers in GLNQ. So yeah. So let me uh, start with some basic uh, definitions and uh, the basic setup of the talk. So let G be any group, be finite or infinite. And let m greater or equal to 2 be an integer and define the power map uh, by omega m from g to g defined by g maps to g power m. So therefore, what we are doing is placing an element of the group, the power m. And this is uh, a well-defined map. Uh, <clears throat> now, the image of this map will denote it by g power m, which is the set of all small g power m such that small g belongs to capital G. So this is the set of mth powers in G. Right? Now, uh, yeah, so if alpha belongs to this, uh, you know, the image, then we call alpha an mth power element in G, or we can say that alpha has an mth root in G. Uh, now, some elementary properties can be observed right away. So if uh, G is a non-abelian group, then uh, this power map need not be a homomorphism of groups. So therefore, the image of this uh, uh, map, which is G power M, need not be a subgroup of the group. So it's just a subset of G. But G power M has a nice property that G power M is invariant under conjugation. So this is very easy to see that if uh, an element alpha belongs to uh, G power M, then any conjugate G alpha G inverse also has to be an mth power. This is uh, very trivial. So therefore, G power M is the union of certain conjugacy classes of G. Okay. Now, if C is a conjugacy class of G such that C is contained in G power M, then we call C a mth power conjugacy class. Right? Okay. So these are the some basic definitions that uh, uh, that are needed. And now we specialize over G is equal to GLNQ, which is the group of all invertible and crossing matrices over the finite field FQ, which is uh, the field with Q elements. Uh, Q has to be a prime power, of course. So from now on, we'll consider G is equal to GLNQ. So that uh, you know, I explains the, 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 the uh, title, uh, the powers. So this is what I mean by powers in GLNQ, the set of mth powers. Right? Now, what are the broad questions that can be asked uh, over this? So the first question, obviously, is the main question is the how, what does an mth power element in GLNQ look like? Right? So what uh, I mean, what can you say about a matrix which has an mth root in GLNQ? What does it look like? Now, uh, one can consider the ratio, which is the size of the image of this map in GLNQ divided by the size of the group. Uh, in terms of probability, this is the probability that a randomly chosen element in GLNQ is a mth power. Right? So, uh, an obvious question is that can we find the value of this, uh, uh, this probability? Obviously, this will uh, be in, uh, in the interval 0 and 1, but can we uh, find an explicit value uh, depending on n, q, and m? Uh, or if not, can we at least estimate it giving, giving tight bounds for this uh, proportion? Right? Certain asymptotic questions can also be of use. So for example, as follows, so fix M and N, M is the power and N is the size of the matrix or in terms of linear algebraic groups, one can say N is the rank of this group. So if we fix M and N and consider this set of uh, these uh, proportions of mth powers and vary it over all Q, Q is a prime power, then it is something which is which sits in, in, inside uh, open zero closed one. So zero is obviously not there because identity is always a mth power. Right? So this sits inside zero and one, and one can ask that what are the limit points of this set? Right? And if uh, there's a, there's a unique limit point, then we can say that limit q tending infinity exists. Right? And similarly, one can fix m and q, which is the size of the field, and vary n. Then it's a sequence in n. And then the same questions, asymptotic questions can also be asked 
or varying n. Right? So in general, the question is that what happens for large values of n and q? Uh, so these, these are at the level of mth power elements. Now, since we also have defined what is mth power conjugacy class, so one can also uh, count the number of mth power conjugacy class in children. That, that, can, that can be of some interest, of course. Um, so what are the number of mth power conjugacy classes in children? So these are uh, the broad questions that we are going to talk about today. Uh, there can be other, of course, there can be other questions also. But this is what we are going to discuss. And uh, we'll see some progress that has been made uh, in this uh, in around these questions right okay so uh, <clears throat> let us now start with some motivation so why am i actually considering this mth uh, i mean the, the, the power map uh, over g and q so uh, before plunging into this motivation i must say that there are uh, two full motivations for this the two viewpoints from which one can see this problem one viewpoint is the viewpoint of word maps so power map is a special case of a more general kind of maps called the word maps but uh, I mean, a month back, Anupam had given a talk here, I suppose. And uh, so he had talked about asymptotics of power maps in finite reductive groups. And he had talked about a lot of word maps, uh, a lot of uh, results that has been uh, uh, proved uh, in the last uh, two decades. So I will just, you know, uh, for, the, uh, for the time constant, I will just skip the, that part for the, of the word maps. And we'll see some other you know, motivations, right? And that motivation is uh, coming from the study of statistical properties over symmetric groups. So uh, Edos and Turan uh, around the 60s uh, initiated this study of, they wrote a series of papers where uh, they talked about a lot of statistical properties over SN. So for example, what is the probability that a randomly chosen permutation is a derangement, for example, which has no fixed points, right? Or for example, uh, what is the probability, what is the expected order of a, a permutation, randomly chosen permutation and so on. And also powers also uh, were mentioned, but not explicitly studied. Uh, so consider r greater or equal to 2 and consider this set of powers, Sn power r, which is pi power r such that pi belongs to Sn. So this is again, we're considering the word map over Sn and we're looking at the image of the word map. So this is a set of rth powers and let prn be the proportion of rth elements in Sn. Right? So this is uh, the size of Sn power r by n factorial. So the first uh, result came around 1974, uh, where uh, Blum studied uh, this uh, power, uh, square permutation. So he took r equals to 2, as he, and using generating functions, he proved this nice uh, relation, uh, kind, I mean, recursive relation, but not really a complete recursive relation. So p2 to n plus 1 is equal to p2 to n for n greater or equal to 1. So if you put n equals to 1, you get p2 to 2 is equal to p2 to 3. Or if you put n equals to 2, you get p2 to 4 equals to p2 to 5, which means that the proportion of squares in S4 is same as the proportion of squares in S5. Right. Uh, further, he gave- Is it easy to see uh, which partitions, uh, which conjugacy classes? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is not that difficult. So uh, it so happens that uh, for squares, uh, the uh, you, you have to take uh, such partitions where even parts occur even number of times. Okay. Yeah. And it can be generalized to any prime in or any, uh, any R. Uh, further, uh, he showed the following uh, asymptotic that uh, P2n is, uh, as a n goes larger, is close to this uh, function, k into root 2 by pi n to the power minus half. So 1 by root n, order of 1 by root n, where uh, capital K is given by this uh, uh, infinite product k equals to 1 to infinity cos hyperbolic 1 by 2k. And he used this generating functions, analytic properties of these generating functions to uh, arrive at this result. Later, several years after 2001, uh, Nicholas Bona and others started RF powers in SN for a prime R. He took a prime R and he proved that this re re relation, uh, the recursive relation actually holds for any prime R. So, which uh, looks like PR n plus 1 is equal to PR n, where n is uh, not e equal to minus 1 mod R. So, if you put n equals to, uh, r equals to 2, you get the Blum's relation. p2 to n plus 1 is equal to p2 to n. Moreover, they showed that prn is a decreasing sequence in n. So prn is a sequence in n, as you can clearly see, if you fix r, and prn is a decreasing sequence in n, and limit n tending infinity, prn equals to 0. So which means that for large n, there are really very less number of uh, I mean, powers uh, concept, uh, with respect to the size of the group. 
uh, and and they you they did not use uh, to mention they did not use generating functions they use uh, really bijective methods to uh, to arrive at these kind of results uh later uh, next year uh, nicolas uh, Puyan, uh, in 2002 uh, generalized uh, blum's result the approximation that blum give gave uh, for any r not just prime r but just any r so prn as n tends to infinity grows as the as the following function pi r by n to the power 1 minus phi r by r. Okay. So where uh, phi denotes the Euler's phi function and pi r an explicit constant depending on r. So uh, if you put r equals to 2, then uh, phi 2 is 1 and you get it is the order of n to the power half, which is basically uh, this is n to the power half, which is basically a uh, plumpsus result, right? Okay. So these are uh, more or less uh, some results over the powers in Hessen. Now, uh, in the uh, in the context of classical groups, uh, uh, Fullman and Walls uh, studied certain uh, statistical properties over classical groups, though not powers, obviously. Uh, so Fullman and Walls separately studied the probability that a randomly chosen matrix in GLN Q is a semi-simple or a regular or a regular semi-simple element. Right? So um, I will come back to this, uh, these elements once again, but let me quickly give the definition. I will give the definition later uh, uh, formally. So semi-simple elements in GLN Q are those which are uh, diagonalizable in its algebraic closure. Uh, and regular elements are those for, for, who, uh, for which the minimal polynomial is equal to the characteristic polynomial. Right? And regular semi-simple element is both regular and semi-simple. So uh, Fullman studied the proportions of these elements and, uh, as well as wall. And they obtained generating functions for these proportions and proved asymptotic results by studying the analytic properties of these generating functions. So to give an example, we can see here that suppose GL and Q RS denote the set of all regular semi-simple elements in GL and Q, then they proved that if you fix Q then and vary the rank, then limit n tending infinity, uh, the size of GL and Q RS, the size of the number of regular semi-simple elements by the size of the group is equal to 1 minus 1 by Q. Okay. So uh, it is worth noting that if we fix the rank n and vary Q, then this limit as Q tends to infinity actually goes to 1. And this is not, which is something exclusive to GLN, uh, it is something which is true for any finite group of Lie-type because of the fact that it is the density property of the regular, regular semi-simple elements in finite group of Lie-type. But if you fix Q and vary the rank, then this is how it looks like. And and they also uh, got the lim limiting values of the proportions of regular elements as well as the proportion of semi-simple elements. Uh, after that, uh, Cheryl Prager, Peter Newman, and Fullman in uh, 2005 extended all these kinds of studies over other finite classical groups, like uh, the symplectic group, or the unitary group, or orthogonal groups, and etc. using a generative function approach once more. Okay. So we'll come back to this uh, once again. So now this, uh, you know, uh, motivates us to see some uh, kind of uh, related question to powers. Okay? So let us consider the following question, which is related to our question of powers. So let m greater equal to 2. And suppose that GLN Q power m RG denotes the number of regular elements in the image of the power map GLN Q power m. So this set is basically the number of mth power regular elements in GLN Q. Similarly, the, the next two, GLN Q power M SS and GLN Q power M RS are respectively the emit power semi-simple elements in GLN Q and emit power regu regular semi-simple elements in GLN Q, right? So if you right away see that if I put M equals to one here, so for example, if I put M equals to one in the first quantity, it just says that number of regular elements in GLN Q, right? This is how we interpret it, right? So these are some, so, I mean, so kind of think about this as some generalization of those sets, right? Now, obtain, so the, one of the questions can be the obtain generating functions for the proportion of mth power regular, semi-simple and regular elements in general, given hence find estimates and asymptotics of this proportion, just like Fullman and Wall did for the m equals to one case, right? And see what turns around with uh, the higher values of m, right? And also, at the level of conjugacy classes, this can be of interest that can we enumerate the number of mth power regular semi-simple and regular semi-simple classes. Right? So we'll, uh, uh, you know, discuss, uh, I mean, the, the, um, the next section of the talk will be more or less around understanding the generating functions that can be obtained from these, uh, for these ratios, right? How, how can we obtain 
generating function for these proportions. Okay. okay. So now uh, we move on to the, uh, I think that the, uh, the question is properly set now and we, we can now see uh, some uh, results uh, which are, which turns up in, in this. Okay. So one of the main tool that I will require to write the generating function is a cycle index in GMT. Okay. So this is what I am going to discuss now. This, this provides a main combinatorial background of this paper uh, that are the talk. Um, so cycle index in GLNQ really uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, was defined for SN by Polya uh, to study some uh, conjugacy class functions, some enumeration problems over partitions. Uh, it, it, it would have been good if I, if we had, uh, I mean, defined this cycle index for SN, it, uh, but anyway, uh, for time constant, I will not do that. Um, so I will just quickly uh, define a cycle index in JIRA and what, what exactly is that one, uh, this, that tool. So we need some notations for that. Uh, and these notations we will use for the rest of our talk. So uh, a partition is a collection of non-negative integers, lambda is equal to lambda one, lambda two, and so on, which are in non-increasing order. So lambda one greater equals to lambda two and so on. And mod lambda is the sum of this lambda i's is finite, right? It should be finite. And that means that after finitely many i's, the lambda i will be all zero. The positive integer lambda i is called a part of the partition lambda. And if mod lambda, the sum of its parts is equal to n, we say that lambda is a partition of them. Or lambda is, this is how it is denoted by. These are some uh, yeah, classical notation. So here is another notation that can be of use and which we will use uh, more often than not. So let lambda be a partition. Uh, for i greater equals to one, let mi denote the number of times i occurred as a part in lambda. So it's the multiplicity of i in lambda. So then in power notation, we write that lambda is equal to one power m1, two power m2, and so on. So m1, I mean, one occurs m1 times, two occurs m2 times, and so on. So for an example, you can take this, that, uh, think about this partition three comma one comma one of six, which can be written as one to the power three into three in power notation. That uh, capital lambda denotes you know, the set of all partitions. So every partition is there, which also includes the empty partition of zero. Okay. Uh, now I need to define one more quantity, which is called the conjugate transpose of a partition. Uh, for that, uh, I need to uh, define what is a Young diagram. Uh, I will do that. So the Young diagram corresponding to a partition is an arrangement of square boxes in rows and columns, but the ith row consists of lambda i number of boxes. Right. So uh, it's good to uh, see that example. So Young diagram of the partition four to one of seven is this thing. So four uh, boxes in the first row, two boxes in the second row, and so on. And then the conjugate transpose of a partition lambda is again a partition of n lambda dash, which is noted by lambda dash and is obtained by transposing the rows and columns of the young data, just as you transpose a matrix. Right? So you get the following uh, thing. So again, an example, so four to one of seven, you can transpose it and you will see that you get this diagram, which is basically three, two, one, one of seven. This is a part of conjugate transpose of four to one. Right? Okay. Uh, let capital phi denote the number of monic non-constant irreducible polynomials over FQ, except the linear polynomial X. So X is also a irreducible polynomial, but I don't include it uh, as you might expect because we're working over GLN, so we'll not need it, right? So yeah, uh, let NQD denote the number of polynomials of degree D in phi, which means that it's the number of monic non-constant irreducible polynomials of degree D. Okay. Uh, we, uh, uh, so this is denoted by NQD. This is again also a very well-known notation. Hey, uh, is the word irreducible missing here? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know the number of, yeah, sorry, sorry. Monic non-constant irreducible. Uh, and no, no, no. So, so what I have written is it denotes the number of polynomials of degree D in capital Phi. So it just means that it is, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So number of monic non constant polynomials of degree D. So NQD is given by the following very well-known formula. One by D summation R divides D mu R Q to the power D by R minus one, where mu is the Mobius function. This is a well-known formula. This is also with me. Now, to define the cycle index of, uh, the cycle index in GLN Q, what we need is a combinatorial parameterization of conjugacy classes in GLN Q, right? So uh, keep a perspective in mind, think of the example of SN, where we see that the number of I mean, the conjugacy classes are parameterized by partitions of it. Right? 
So this something similar will be done here. So here is how we do it. So consider a map from capital phi to lambda, capital lambda. We call that capital phi was the set of all polynomials, monic non-constant irreducible polynomials except the polynomial x, and capital lambda was a set of all partitions. Right. So uh, so 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 consider a map from this to this. And such a function, what it does, so it, it attaches to each f belongs to phi a partition lambda of mod lambda, right? So we can write it as f maps to lambda f, which is a partition of mod lambda f, which is the sum of its parts, right, by our notation. Okay. okay. So uh, now, what is, uh, so this is one of the main, uh, uh, you know, thing that we we'll use, the conjugacy class in Jiren Q, are in one one correspondence with functions from capital phi to lambda, Satisfying the relation summation over all f belongs to capital phi degree f into mod lambda f is equal to n. Right? So uh, the conjugacy class in GNQ are in one-one correspondence with this data. You can think of this as data. So a function from capital phi to lambda satisfying this summation relation. Now, one quick observation is this: that uh, because of this this uh, criteria, you see that there are only finitely many polynomials f such that lambda f is a non-empty partition. Right? And for all others, f, they will map to empty partition of zero, right? So, yeah, so this is clear. Now we'll see how this, I mean, correspondence happens. So I'll give an explicit correspondence. So let us start with a conjugacy class C in G and Q and an element alpha in the conjugacy class. And recall that the FQX V alpha, FQX module V alpha, which is really V itself, has the following decomposition, right? In terms of, so V alpha is, isomorphic to n1, gx of n2, and so on. But these ni's are fi primary component of v, but fi is a monic non-constant irreducible polynomial. So when I say fi primary component, I mean that ni is the submodule of v alpha annihilated by some power of fi, right? So in uh, more explicitly, ni looks like something like this. So if qx divided by, uh, these are uh, direct sum of cyclic modules over if qx, uh, if qx quotiented by f ix to the power lambda i1, gx of fqx quotiented by fix to the power lambda i2, and so on. And this thing allows you to attach this data where what you do. So, so you attach this data that if I map to the partition lambda I1, which are the blocks that are occurring. Right? So lambda, so if I maps to lambda if I, which is the powers lambda I1, written in obvious non-increasing order, lambda I1, lambda I2, and so on. Right? For each I equals to one to two, and you map all other polynomials in phi to the empty partition of zero, which does not occur as primary component. So this gives you a function from capital phi to capital lambda satisfying this summation relation. And this summation relation is pretty clear because if you see the dimension of ni, so this is basically degree of fi into, into lambda i1 plus degree of fi into lambda i2 and so on. So it's basically degree of fi into mod lambda fi. And you su sum it over all such things and you get the n, which is the dimension of the vector space because you are in GLN, right? So this uh, automatically turns up. Uh, the criteria. Right? So, so, so what I have done is to a conjugacy class in uh, uh, we have attached a data uh, and then conversely, if you have a data of this form, then one can easily define a conjugacy class by the pair f comma lambda f, where lambda f is a non-empty partition, right? Uh, and this f comma lambda f actually defines a f primary component of an element in C. So this, this correspondence is bijective because the conjugacy class in GNQ is uniquely defined by a collection of admissible elementary devices, right? Uh, so therefore this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, I mean, correspondence is a bijective one, right? Okay, so we now have a data attached to each conjugacy class in GLN, right? Now this allows you to define the cycle index in GNQ. So let us, uh, so this is the most important uh, thing uh, in the talk. So we will slowly go over it. So let x of f comma lambda be a variable associated to a pair f comma lambda, where f is a monic non-constant irreducible polynomial and lambda a partition, right? So uh, the cycle, yeah, so, so this is the, a variable here. The cycle index is defined as follows. So it's a, it's a multivariate polynomial corresponding to this group GLN Q. So Z GLN Q is given by one by mod GLN Q summation running over all elements of GNQ and uh, the product uh, running over all F belongs to capital Phi such that Lambda F of alpha is a non-empty partition. Right? 
and the product over these variables x f comma lambda f of alpha right now straight away one thing uh, you see that uh, this product here is a finite product because Uh, I may have been muted or something. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you see that the uh, product here is uh, f belongs to capital phi over lambda f of alpha mod greater than zero x of f comma lambda f alpha. So you see that this product inside is a finite product because there are only finitely many polynomials f such that this lambda f is a non-empty partition, right? So. Uh, <clears throat> So this is uh, uh, the cycle index. So it's a polynomial, and to see what exactly this is, we have to uh, you know, uh, understand this. So you consider a monomial here. So a monomial of the form x f one lambda f one, x f two lambda f two, and x f l lambda f l, right? Now you see, and suppose that this summation criteria is satisfied, then what is the coefficient of the monomial occurring here in this polynomial? That coefficient is. Now you see that this f1 lambda f1, f2 lambda f2, and fl lambda fl, this actually defines a unique conjugacy class in C that we have seen in the previous slide, right? And therefore, let us call that conjugacy class the conjugacy class of some alpha, where alpha is some element in that conjugacy class, right? Then you see that the, the, the coefficient of such a monomial here is the following, uh, more, uh, the size of the conjugacy class of alpha divided by the size of the group, which comes from the outside, right? So because because what happens is that if you take conjugate elements here the product remains the same because the product only depends on the combinatorial data and therefore they add up and they add up how many times the number of the number of elements that are there in that conjugacy class right so yeah so this uh, gives you this uh, uh, the coefficient and you see that this particular coefficient is nothing but one by the centralizer of alpha by the orbit stabilizer theorem right whereas uh, z alpha denotes the centralizer of alpha in gl and q so uh, what it really does, if you uh, uh, visualize this, then you see that this, this cycle index is nothing but the class equation of GLN, written where a monomial is attached to each numbers occurring in the class equation, right? So yeah, so uh, this is what uh, it is. Um, yeah. So now uh, you see that uh, here is a very, I mean, it looks complex uh, this uh, for formula but this is a very well known formula this is a centralizer formula that we will need okay so this is the centralizer formula for alpha which is given by the following uh, big expression here uh, product running over f belongs to capital phi uh, lambda f of alpha is greater than zero so running over all so this is this again this product is a finite uh, product q to the power degree f into summation over j lambda dash i j squared so this is so if you consider so so this is what so the, if the if the partition lambda f is lambda i1, lambda i2, and so on. So this is the conjugate transpose of the partition and the square of the parts, the sum of the square of the parts. And this product inside is product t greater equals to 1, 1 by q to the power degree f. Uh, in the suffix empty lambda f, so remember that empty lambda f is the multiplicity of t occurring in lambda f. right? So this we have defined. And this notation means the following. So u by q suffix i means 1 minus u by q into 1 minus u by q, q square so on up to 1 minus u by q to the power i right so so you put u equals to 1 and q replace q by q q to the power degree f that is what is here and i is just empty lambda f right so this is the i mean uh, the formula the very well known formula for this uh, centralizer and this will actually give you the following theorem which is the most important one here so for each GLN, we have got a multivariate polynomial, which is the cycle index Z, Q, and here is the generate. So, so, so here is the generating function for the cycle index. So, here is this. So, basically, the coefficient of u power n here is the multivariate polynomial corresponding to this GLN Q. So, one plus summation n equals to one to infinity Z, Q, Q power n can be given by this uh, factorization here, okay, which uh, runs over all. F belongs to capital phi, so this is an infinite product that runs over all F belongs to capital phi, uh, and this something is uh, is a big term inside. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can see here uh, that the x comma f x f comma lambda is attached here with uh, this thing inside the I mean the denominator is the centralizer actually of the block defined by f comma lambda. 
right? So this is, I mean, okay, it needs a formal proof though, but uh, I mean, at least it is, uh, I mean, it, I mean, it can be, uh, we can ha get an idea that, okay, something like this is going to come because of the fact that the coefficient is given by the one by the centralizer of alpha, right? So, uh, yeah, so, but we will not prove it, we'll assume this, uh, yeah, so uh, a quick observation is this. So if we go back a uh, slide, uh, a slide before, now look at the cycle index once again. Now if I put one in all the variables x, f, comma, lambda, then this sum, run, run, this sum runs over all alpha belongs to GL and Q, and this product is one. So, so it's basically size of GL and Q by the size of GL and Q. So it gives you one. So basically you are taking, you are including all conjugacy classes. That is what it means, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so this gives you one. So here you see that that means that in this case here in the generating function, if you put x of f comma lambda here, so then you get one as the coefficient, right? Uh, for each coefficient, so that is basically one plus u plus u squared and so on, the geometric uh, power series, which is one by one minus u. Right? Okay. So now this uh, allow this actually what it does it gives a unified way to write the generating functions of. Uh, certain kind of uh, I mean, proportions which are really conjugacy class functions so which are invariant under conjugation uh, for example the power map we, that we have so let us see uh, that uh, so let's see quick application of this uh, uh, formula uh, so as i said uh, fullman and wall uh, obtain the generating function for the regular semi simple and regular semi simple elements so we'll see some examples here so uh, uh, a matrix a over fq is called semi simple if it is diagonalizable in fq bar uh, and a matrix A over FQ is called regular if the minimal polynomial of A coincide with the characteristic polynomial of A, right? And a regular semi-simple element is one which is both regular and semi-simple, right? Okay, so uh, therefore, what does these properties mean in terms of the combinatorial parameterization of an element, right? So what does semi-simple means in terms of the combinatorial data, right? So it just means that for each F, the partition that you have lambda F alpha is such that all parts are equal to one. And that is rightly so because it is diagonalizable so the minimal polynomial is separable, right? And therefore you cannot, I mean, have size, larger size blocks, right? So, so therefore it is the partition one comma and polynomial for all F such that lambda F actually maps to a non-empty partition. When alpha is regular, then what does it mean? Then it means that the partition lambda F corresponding to some F consists of a single part, right? Because of the fact that uh, the minimal polynomial is equal to the characteristic polynomial. So therefore, uh, each co primary component actually a cyclic uh, module, right? Uh, and regular semi-simple is just punching these two conditions together. So it is just uh, uh, just a one. The mod lambda uh, uh, the mod lambda f alpha is one, and it's just trivial partition of one. That's all, right? Okay. So now we can use this combinatorial data to immediately write the generating functions for these elements. So here are uh, the generating functions of these uh, uh, proportions of regular semi-simple elements, uh, regular elements, and uh, the semi-simple elements. So yeah, so I will uh, maybe explain one of them, the first one, which looks the most uh, convenient to, uh, to prove. So here is this, so the proportion, the generating function for the proportion of regular semi-simple elements in G and Q is given by this following infinite product form, product D greater equal to one, one plus U to the power D, Q to the power D minus one, to the power NQD. Recall that NQD was a number of monic, monic non-constant irreducible polynomials of degree D. Right? Now, how do we get it? So let us see, this is a clear application of this uh, cycle index. So let me go back once more to this uh, thing. So now recall that what we need for uh, the regular semi-simple element. So we need that the lambda, the partition lambda has to be just a trivial partition of one, right? So what we'll do, is put x f comma lambda is equal to zero if lambda is not the trivial partition of one because those are not the regular semi simple elements so we will not have to include that and then we'll put x of f comma lambda is equal to one when lambda is the trivial partition of one now here you see so that means that j has to be equal to one so therefore this summation will vanish and this is just running over the single uh, summation because it's just the part trivial partition of one and what effect does this bring inside this denominator here so Q to the power degree F into, this is the trivial partition of one. So the conjugate transpose is also a trivial partition of one. So it's just Q to the power degree F into 
the product here is 1 by q to the power degree f into m1 lambda is 1 right so it is just 1 here so it is just q to, the denominator is just q to the power degree f into 1 minus 1 by q to the power degree f right and the product outside runs over all polynomials in phi and now you see that the inside thing only depends on the degree of the polynomial so therefore you can club together all uh, su such polynomials with the same degree right and therefore you get the following uh, thing so product over d greater or equal to 1 1 plus u to the power degree f now degree f is replaced by just g by q to the power degree f minus 1 so now again once again degree f is replaced by just d so it is q to the power degree minus 1 by because we have clubbed together all polynomials of degree d you get the number of such polynomials which is mqt okay. so this is the generating function so you can see easily how the cycle index helps in getting these uh, generating functions so and I, I will not go on explaining these regular elements and uh, semi-simple elements, uh, but they can be done exactly by using the same argument. Right? Okay. Now uh, we have seen that the cyclic index is really a powerful technique to get the generating functions. Now we can go to the last section of the talk, which is the main part of this talk, which is the generating function for the powers in GLM Q. Right. So we'll now talk about uh, the powers in GLM Q. So to understand powers in GLM Q, so the main motive here is to uh, uh, characterize that when does an when does an invertible matrix has an mth root in the group GL and Q, right? So for doing that, we need certain uh, polynomials, right? Which we call m power polynomials. So what are these? So consider m greater or equal to two be an integer for a polynomial f of x of this form degree d polynomial. Consider the composed polynomial f of x power m, right? Which is just putting replacing this x by x power m. So you get the polynomial of degree md. Right? Now, uh, uh, with this polynomial in hand, we defined what are called what we call m power polynomials. So what are these? So a non constant. So first we define it for irreducible polynomials. So an, now observe one quick thing that if fx is a irreducible polynomial, f of x power m need not be irreducible anymore. Right? It can be reducible. Right? So a non-constant irreducible monic polynomial fx belongs to fqx is said to be an empowered polynomial if fx power m, the composed polynomial, has an irreducible factor of degree equal to degree of f. Right? So if degree of f equals to d, then f of x power m must have an irreducible factor of degree d. Right? So to, quick, to take a quick example, uh, if you consider the linear polynomial x minus lambda, then the then the composed polynomial is x to the power m minus lambda, and that polynomial is the m power polynomial if it has an irreducible factor of degree one. So it is a linear factor. That means some x power mu, x minus mu. So which in turn means that lambda is a mth power in the field f q, right? Yeah. And in general, so this was a definition for irreducible polynomials. In general, a non-constant monic polynomial f. Is said to be an power polynomial if each irreducible factor of f is an empower polynomial. Right? So each factor is just an empower polynomial. Okay, so this is uh, one of the main definitions, and this is this will play the most important role uh, in, in determining the powers. So let capital phi power m be the set of all f belongs to phi, such which are empower polynomials. Right. So capital phi power m is the set of all non-constant monic. Uh, Irreducible uh, polynomials, which are empower polynomials, right? So this is just a subset of the bigger set capital Phi. Right? Uh, let once again, uh, exactly as NQD, we can count the number of such polynomials. In NQD, you know the number of monic non-constant empower polynomials of degree, d, of degree d, x that takes. And here is a formula for uh, this uh, uh, you know, thing, which looks uh, a little messy, but yeah, I mean this is what we have. Uh, 1 by d summation r over d mu r into this following fraction, which is so this, so this the outside bracket is basically GCD. Okay, so GCD of m into q to the power d by r minus 1, comma q to the power d minus 1 by m into q to the power d minus 1. Right? Anyway, we can just take the denominator outside because it does not depend on r. Okay. One observation, quick observation is this that if we put m equals to 1, we get back nqd. This is just mu r into q to the power d by r minus 1. Right? And rightly so, because when you put m equals to 1, it's just the number of reducible polynomials of degree d. Right? Okay. 
So we have this uh, uh, number, we'll not prove this. Uh, now, uh, we need finally to say something about the mth power elements in GNQ. We need a proposition here, uh, which is as follows. So assume that the GCD of m comma q is equal to one. And moreover, assume that capital M is equal to some prime power, R power A. Okay. So with this assumption, suppose fx is an irreducible polynomial of degree d over fq, then either of the two cases can occur. So this proposition really says that how can f of x power m factor? Okay, what are the degrees that are possible to get? Okay, so the number of one case is that f of x power m has an irreducible factor of degree d, right? That is, f is an m power polynomial. That is one case that we, that we can have, or else this is the remaining case that we can have. That if this is not the case, if, if the first one doesn't happen, then the polynomial f of x power m factors as a product of r to the power a minus i irreducible factors each of degree d into r to the power i. For some this, i. Can, yeah. can you just slow down a bit here? It's, it's going very fast. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, firstly, this formula above n m q d. Yeah. Now, this is the first time I'm seeing that uh, you've sort of, as a function of q, this is no longer a polynomial. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, yeah. but does it have some nice, uh, is it uh, quasi polynomial or something like that? Or? Uh, I, I don't really know uh, that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have, I mean, we have some characterization of NMQD in terms of NQD, though. Uh, Do we know how it, uh, yeah, what kind of function of Q is it for a fixed N is sort of my question. When M is one, of course, we know just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your yeah. is, is one. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So maybe I should have given some examples, uh, direct computations, but we do not have this now in this slide. Uh, yeah. But for so, something like M equals two, is it very simple? Uh, uh, not really. I mean, okay. For for for, uh, for for example, if you take d equals to one, then this is just q minus one by GCD of m comma q minus one, right? Because this is just the mth power yeah. elements in f q. Right. So a denominator comes there. Right. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I get back to this proposition once again. Uh, so so yeah, here is slim slowly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, see here that, uh, so what this proposition here says that, what we, so what we need here to understand the mth power polynomials is the, uh, I mean, rather the mth uh, roots here uh, of the matrices here is that how this polynomial factorizes and what are the possible degrees that can come uh, as factors, right? So here are the two possibilities that can occur. Okay. So, uh, the polynomial f of x power m has an irreducible factor of degree d, which means that by definition it's a m power polynomial. And uh, number two is that the polynomial f of x, if that does not happen, then f of x power m factors as a product of certain number of irreducible polynomials, each of the same degree. And that degree is given by d into r to the power i for some i from one to a. Right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, if we, if, we, if we want to see an example, if we take, for example, m to be just a prime, not the prime power, a equals to one, then it means that f of x power m has an irreducible factor of degree d, or f of x power m is irreducible. So this is a trivial case. So either it, it has a uh, factor of degree d or it is irreducible because f of x power m factors as a product of irreducible polynomials each of degree d into r to the power i. So here i is one. So it's just d into m. So it's just irreducible. Okay. Okay. So now, once we have this uh, proposition, then we can uh, say something about uh, the the uh, the mth power elements. So, in regard to this uh, proposition here, we can define a notation here. Uh, so suppose m q equals to one and capital M equals to r power a, where r is a prime, then i greater equal to one less equal to a let phi m i be the set of all f belongs to phi such that f of x power m factors as a product of irreducible polynomials each of degree equal to r to the power i into degree f right so now in regard to this proposition what we have that phi is basically a disjoint union of these things so phi power m so this is the set of all m power polynomials so this is the first case that can happen 
or else that if that if can be in something like this right so it can be in some phi of m comma i because it will factor as uh, uh, factor as the product of irreducible factors each of degree d into r to the power i right so this is really a disjoint union right? so this is what you can have and uh, yeah so so in regard to this here is a theorem which determines the mth powers in jiren uh, of course with certain constraint uh, so uh, one of the main theorem is this that if we assume that m is a prime power m is r power a where r is a prime and the gcd of m comma q is equal to 1 and suppose alpha belongs to jiren q which is an element in jiren then the equation x to the power m equals to alpha that means that alpha has a solution in jiren q which means that alpha is actually the mth power in jiren q if and only if for each f belongs to phi such that f i mean uh, i mean for each f belongs to phi such that the partition corresponding to f is a non zero a non empty partition one of the following holds one of the following conditions hold right number one is that f is belongs to phi power m so f is a m power polynomial right this is the number one condition or else it can be given by this condition that if f belongs to some i mean he, something here phi of m comma b then a certain condition over the partition has to be satisfied okay and that condition is this that if f belongs to phi m comma b then r to the power b divides mj lambda f for all j greater equals to 1 which means that the i mean r to the power b this number this thing divides the number of times each part occurred so each part occurs uh, i mean the multiplicity of each part is a multiple of r to the power b that is what it means right so this is the two condition that can ensure that alpha has an mth root in j and q and conversely also so this is an if and only if condition it is important that this is an if and only if condition right okay so uh, uh, yeah so, so so this is one of the main theorem but you see that we have two constraints one is that m is a prime power and other is that the gcd of q and m is equal to 1 right okay so uh, now we'll go to some special cases uh, quickly if we assume that in fact alpha is semi simple then what happens then immediately from this what we get is that uh, recall that for f belongs to phi if alpha is semi simple then this partition is just given by all parts being one right so therefore this uh, uh, condition remains the same if is a m power polynomial or f belongs to phi b and r to the power b divides mod lambda f that's all it is because it's the sum of ones so here is the corollary here. So let m equals to r power a where as a prime and q of uh, m is equal to one. Then alpha belongs to zero and q is uh, and let alpha belongs to zero and q be semi simple. Then alpha is a mth power in zero and q if and only if for each f belongs to phi. Either f is a m power polynomial or uh, f belongs to phi m comma b for each b and r to the power b divides mod lambda. F. So it is just invoking the semi simple condition in the main theorem. That is uh, how you get this already. Now here is another proposition which talks about the regular. So we, we said that we'll talk about semi simple mth power semi simple elements, mth power regular elements, and mth power regular semi simple elements, right? So we have talked about uh, mth power semi simple elements, but here is a proposition about mth power regular elements, which which uh, is something. Like, so this uh, is uh, is something uh, which is uh, given by a very nice condition. That uh, suppose m greater equal to two be an integer and GCD of m comma q equals to one. So uh, notice one thing that I am not assuming that m is a prime power anymore here in this uh, particular condition, right? Then alpha belongs to Jiren q. Suppose alpha belongs to Jiren q be regular or regular semi simple. Then alpha is a mth power if and only if f is an m power polynomial for all f such that lambda mod lambda f alpha is greater than zero. So it is just that we need that f is an m power polynomial and that will ensure that a regular element will have a mth root okay now you can clearly see that i have not written it as a corollary of the previous uh, theorem because here that condition that prime power is not there at all so this is an independent proposition of its own right uh, one important thing uh, to mention here in this three uh, uh, back to i mean back to back result that we have for the powers is that uh, you know you can ask that okay why the, why is this important this 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 assumption that m is a prime power right the it is important because of the fact that it, 
we could actually uh, get this uh, proposition here the the explicit degrees that occur as irreducible factors in the factorization of f of x power m that we could only get for m is a prime power but in principle our proof will also work for any m if we can actually get the information on the degrees but it's really difficult as it seems for now that to uh, to get the explicit uh, i mean uh, like the conditions on, on what degrees are going to come as factors so that uh, like uh, hinders this uh, process and therefore we have to assume that m is a prime power in the most general case right uh, okay so uh, i have a sketch of the proof but i i, I don't know uh, i probably will have not enough time so i will maybe skip this uh, particular sketch and go towards the generating functions which was the main interest uh, yeah so let us see the generating functions now so recall that we wanted to find the generating functions for the mth power, the proportions of mth power regular elements, mth power uh, regular semi-simple elements, and mth power uh, semi-simple elements in GLM Q. Uh, so let us see uh, such uh, things here now. So here is a generating function for the proportion of regular semi-simple elements, which are mth powers in GLM Q. So suppose m greater equal to two, and we are just assuming that GCD of Q comma m equals to one. Then the generating function for the proportion of regular semi-simple elements, which are mth powers in GNQ, is given by this following uh, infinite product, which is uh, product d greater equals to one, one plus u to the power d by q to the power d minus one to the power n and q d. Right. Now, one important uh, thing to observe here is that if we go back, if we recall what was the generating function for just the proportion of regular semi-simple elements, so then it was just this where n and q d was just n q d. Right? So here you see that putting m equals to one, we get back the, the one in, for the regular semi simple elements, right? And to see a proof of this particular thing, the proof is exactly the same as how we did it for the regular uh, semi, -simple, semi simple elements. Let us go back to the uh, to the uh, uh, some slides back here in the, the cycle index generating function, right? So recall that a uh, mth power regular, I mean an, a regular element is mth power if and only if f belongs to capital phi power m. That is f is a m power polynomial so in the so to obtain the generating function what you have to do is do the same thing that you did for regular semi simple element invoking those uh, ones and zeros in these variables but now the outer sum outer product will run over not the whole capital phi but just the capital phi power m so outer sum will run over only the set i mean the m power polynomials right and once again you uh, i mean club all the polynomials of degree d the m power polynomials of degree d and you get the uh, by definition it is the term nmqd right so therefore you get that nmqd in the power right here is the nmqd in the power and similar thing happens for the regular because the same is the condition for the regular elements right so therefore you again see that the same thing occurs but there's just, there is just one change in the power that uh, now the power occurs as nmqd and not nqd right and you put m equals to one you get that the original one Okay, so these are the generating functions for uh, the emit proportions of emit power regular elements and emit power uh, uh, regular, uh, regular semi simple elements. Uh, the proportion of uh, uh, emit power semi simple elements looks a little complicated here because of the complicated condition that we have uh, that, that, that uh, I mean, gives the characterization of the powers. So I have written it for just applying M not a prime power because we could, we could have written it for prime power, but just to make it simple, I wrote it for a prime. Okay, so assume that m is a prime and q comma m is equal to one. So the generating function for the proportion of m at power semi simple elements in GM q is looks something like this. So uh, here is this. So there are two products here, if you can see. Uh, so uh, you see once again that uh, if you take m equals to one, then so so what is this? So the first product is the same thing, the in the case of regular semi simple element, but the power now changes to m q d. Right, and in the second component, we have this. The, it is the same as the first component where j is replaced by m j. Right, and then now the power is just n hat q d, where n hat q d is n q d minus n m q d. Okay, so uh, if you before going into the proof, a quick observation once again is that if m equals to one, then n hat q d vanishes because n m q d is just any n q d. And this n hat qd is just zero then, and this second component vanishes, and this is just nqd in the in the power. So you just get back uh, the the proportion of semi simple elements once again. 
Now, uh, a proof of this, a quick proof of this uh, uh, can be, uh, I mean, a sketch or let's say, I would say, so let us go back to the, to the, uh, to the corollary once again. So, so, so this was basically the, the uh, characterization of semi-simple elements, which are MF powers, right? So there were two conditions that either your, if the polynomial F is a M power polynomial, or else F belongs to phi of M comma B for some B greater equals to one and R to the power B divides mod lambda F. Now for the generating function, I've assumed that A is equal to one, that is M is a prime. So therefore the second condition becomes a little more, I mean, I mean little simple that F belongs to, so F is a irreducible polynomial. So F is not in phi M, right? And R, R to the power now one becomes capital M, just capital M. So M divides mod lambda F, right? So therefore, if you go back to this cycle index once again here, so you'll see that uh, here uh, in the generating, uh, sorry, uh, in the generating function here. Uh, so here you see what do you, what, what changes do you need to put? So this the changes that you need to put for semi-simple element. Of course, the changes that you had had to put before you had all, all you have to put those again here. So you have to put that uh, lambda is a partition one comma one comma one. Uh, I mean all parts are one. So that will give the th the thing inside. But now you see that there, there will be two components, one for the M power polynomials. So because if your F is a M power polynomials, then the solution will exist, right? So there's a one component where the product will run over all M power polynomials, right? But then there is another condition where F runs over all polynomials, which are not M power polynomials, because we have taken M is a prime, but then you see that this J has to be divisible by M because I have said that M divides mod lambda F, right? So therefore M has to be divisible by M. And now if we remove that divisibility condition from the summation sign, then J has to be replaced by MJ. Okay? So uh, therefore uh, that gives you this, uh, this uh, thing. And then once again, you do the same thing, club all polynomials of the same degree. And therefore you get this particular uh, thing uh, in MQD uh, in the denominator of the first component and in hat QD, which is because that set runs, the second component runs over all polynomials which are not empower polynomials. So that is NQD minus NMQD, a number of such degree polynomials. So this gives you uh, the, the second component here. Okay, okay. so uh, this uh, mostly finishes the thing that I wanted to uh, talk, uh, the generating functions for the powers, uh, the generating function for a general element can also be written in the same way, but that will look a little more messy here. Uh, but I don't uh, write it here. Uh, now, finally, uh, I want to uh, mention some more things. Uh, so we have the generating functions, that, but then there will be a question that, uh, you know, can we, what kind of informations can we get from these generating functions? So in that regard, uh, you know, we have some uh, very limited results right now. Uh, this is a, a, a work in progress, but uh, we'll, I'll mention just one such result. Okay. So, uh, so before that, a subjectivity uh, thing, uh, when is this power map subjective? Uh, this is a very easy condition here. I mean, I mean, it's very easy to determine when the when this map is subjective. In fact, in over any finite group, because a power map over a finite group is uh, subjective, if and only if the power capital M is co-prime to the size of G, the cardinality of G. And if you invoke that condition for GLN, you get the following condition that so I have assumed M is a prime, but you don't need to assume M is a, M is a prime anyway. Uh, so then the power map omega M on G and Q is subjective if and only if GCD of Q and M is equal to one and N is less than order of Q. Where N is less than O of Q, where O of Q is the order of Q in Z by M Z star. See the order of Q in Z by M Z star is defined because the GCD of M comma Q is equal to one. And this is, so basically it says that in certain lower rank cases, the subjectivity can hold, right? N is less than OQ. So it's really a lower rank case, right? So it, it, is, it, is, this, it is in this case that the subjectivity hold and this is an if and only if condition, right? Okay, now here is a theorem, uh, which, so this theorem actually talks about, uh, we, could, we could find explicit value of this proportion for certain lower rank cases. So this is uh, how this value looks like. So let me read it out. So let M be a prime and assume MQ equals to one. And let T denote the order of Q in Z by MZ star. Okay. Then this proportion of Mth power elements here, G L N Q power M by the size of G L N Q is given by this sum product formula. 
So summation running over all partitions of n and lambda written in the power notation here, one by m to the power pi t lambda into product over i one to the power m i factorial into i to the power m i. But what is pi t lambda? What is this term pi t lambda? So pi t lambda denotes the number of parts of lambda divisible by t. And this equality holds in a lower rank case where n is less than mt. Okay, so this is an equality here that could be achieved from the generating functions that has been obtained uh, by us. So uh, one quick observation here is that if you take n less than t, just t, then you see that this pi t lambda actually becomes zero because there will be no parts that are divisible by t, right? Because pi t lambda is just the number of parts divisible by t. So if lambda is a partition of n where n is less than t, then pi t lambda vanishes, right? And this is one by m to the power, this scaling factor goes away and you just have that, have it to be one, which is the subjectivity uh, condition, right? Because this is just a cl class equation of Sn, right? So therefore this is just uh, one here. So the, 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 the subjectivity is reflected here, right? But it tells something more that if n is less than empty, then you can get some more values in the lower rank cases. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean accurate values here. These are equalities. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, so let me, you know, I'll finish this talk with some examples here. So just uh, understanding this theorem in a better way. So if we take, for example, m equals to three, capital M equals to three. So let three q equals to one. Then you see that z by 3z star is just z2. So t can be 1 or 2, right? So if t is equal to 1, then you see this is a trivial case, gl1 q cube by this thing. So this is basically the cubes in fq star, which is 1 by 3. And that can be easily found out from this formula, right? And uh, when, uh, and so n is less than mt, right? This is the condition here. So m is 3 and t is 1. So we can only write the equality for n less than 3, which is 1 and 2. So one is this case and two is this. This is how you can calculate it. So GL2 uh, comma Q cube by this is this plus this, which comes from this formula actually. Okay, if you uh, compute this formula, you get this, which is basically two by N, uh, sorry, two by nine. Right? And similarly, if T is equal to two, that is when Q is two mod three, then, I mean, what are the cases that we can give equality for? So N less than MT, so M is three and T is two, so N less than six. That is, we can give equalities for up till the rank five case, right? So this is how, how, how it looks like. So here, yeah, these are some computations here, which are just a direct computation from uh, the expression that we have. Uh, we'll give you this uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> sums here. So you can see that uh, GL2 cube uh, by GL2 here for Q2 mod three is just two by three. But here for when it's Q, Q is one mod three, it's two by nine. So here is a comparison here. So it's two by nine here and two by three here. And similarly for three, four, and five, you can get these uh, results. Yeah, so this uh, uh, finishes the talk. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, Let us thank Riju Broto for this wonderful talk. Um, thank you. That was a very nice talk and I especially appreciated your uh, beautiful exposition of cycle index theory for GLNFQ. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, really nice. Um, yeah, let's see if people have any questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Please just unmute your mic and ask. Uh, I have a question about this last theorem. Yeah. Is it uh, true that uh, this uh, proportion is weakly decreasing and increases as n goes from one to mt? Minus yeah, uh, it seems so. Uh, but we have not proved it, but it seems so. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, because uh, maybe it's not so hard, right? Because uh, this you have written lambda in this way, but it, that factor is actually n factorial oh, by no, z lambda. Uh, sorry, I, uh, so, oh, okay, you, did, did you ask that it's weakly decreasing on, as, as uh, t grows, t increases, that's what you said? No, as n, uh, what did I say? So, no, 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 uh -huh. as n increase, I mean, it's just from your data. But, but this is an equality in just in a lower rank case. I mean, 
this is yeah, not. Yeah. A, so, and so just like you said, n goes from one up to m t minus one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that is something you can prove, or uh, yeah, I suppose because this uh, scaling factor uh, uh, probably uh, increases, right? Uh, I mean, here uh, it is. Uh, so probably that should uh, give that, right? But in fact, uh, but I but what, what the number of terms increases? But the number of terms increases, right? Right. So yeah, but but probably it will not be difficult because we can write a generating function for this number itself, right here. Ah. Uh, depending on n right fixing t uh, and mm -hmm. then probably one can maybe say something about the coefficient yeah that would I mean, be maybe an interesting corollary yeah yeah but but in general it seems obviously that uh, if n tends to infinity then uh, uh, probably uh, it seems that uh, if you fix q if you fix q here and n tends to infinity then it seems that it can be decreasing uh -huh. uh, sequence on n yeah. Any other questions? So, uh, nobody else? Anupam, you have a question? No, no. Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, firstly, do you have results about uh, the number of conjugacy classes of M power? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I didn't say anything about the conjugacy classes because of the time constraint, but we have generating functions for that. Uh, okay. But uh, we haven't been able to find some properties, just like uh, there are certain properties for the conjugacy classes in GLN. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, you know, the kind of like the, const the property of the constant terms or the some higher order terms are, uh, can be uh, you know, uh, derived from that, from the generating function for the number of conjugacy classes in GLN. So similar kind of things uh, we couldn't uh, find out yet, you know, but the generating functions are there. But uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, yeah, so th this paper con contains mostly the generating functions, right? And uh, one needs to do a more careful study of those generating functions uh, to get this uh, you know, kind of uh, result, but we don't have anything yet. I have a more general question, yeah. which is not uh, concerned with this second part of your talk, but with the general cycle index theory and so on. Yeah. So uh, for uh, symmetric groups, uh, it is known that the uh, number of uh, I cycles yeah. as n tends to infinity is uh, yeah. distributed uh, by a Poisson distribution with okay. uh, expectation uh, one over I. Okay. And that these different cycles are essentially asymptotically they are independent the number of huh. cycles. Um, are there similar results for GLNFQ? Do we know that if we take a random element of GLNFQ, for example, yeah, yeah, what yeah. is going to be the uh, you know how many yeah, yeah. how many yeah. uh, degree Q polynomials, degree D polynomials, and what partitions should we expect? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think there are certain results which I am not really, uh, I don't know exactly the results, but uh, uh, Fullman has worked over this, uh, uh, over this, and uh, I think there are some results. Uh, so there is a paper by Fullman, which is uh, 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 random matrix theory over finite fields. Okay. Uh, where uh, probably there are certain results of this type, but I really don't remember uh, if there is any. I mean, I have not seen it, I mean, explicitly, but uh, uh, I think Fullman's work has something about this. Okay, I'll try to yeah, take yeah. a look at that. So, yeah, so this is a paper by Fullman, Random Matrix Theory over Finite Fields. And another uh, comment, perhaps your uh, generating functions will tell you how to uh, generate uh, random m power elements and so on, provided you can find a way to uh, generate uh, random m power polynomials and polynomials in these different classes. So it actually gives you a construction. Yeah. Okay. You pick your polynomials and then you. So it may be interesting also from that point of view that okay. uh, you want a fast algorithm to ah, find okay. a random point in GLNFQ, mm -hmm. which is an empty power. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
that yeah that, that can be interesting on the computational point of view yeah uh, yeah 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 so even though you know it's hard to always take the generating function at common uh, enumerative results sometimes they do tell you a lot about the structure of the set yeah. yeah 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 in this yeah. case they certainly are doing that yeah yeah of course yeah that is a good question. so uh, so yeah one last question so what next where do you plan to go from here uh yeah so uh, this uh, you see that uh, this uh, there's an equality here as you see in the last theorem but uh, Mm -hmm. But I think that there more can be said about this. I mean, uh, it seems to me that we can find some bounds using the generating functions. Okay, so uh, for these MF power elements, uh, uh, we we have to estimate certain error terms because uh, there are these kind of, uh, as you see here in the semi-simple case, you get two components here. Uh, similarly, in the case of general, there is, uh, I mean, more than one component. And you know some kind of estimation of those components, we can give us some bounds. That is one uh, thing that uh, I mean, more some more information about this, uh, and that bound itself can tell something about the end-ending infinity limit, which we have not solved, because the Q-tending infinity is solved mm -hmm. by Anupam's talk, because Anupam uh, uh, talked about the uh, the Q-tending infinity limit for any finite reductive group, no, not just GLN. Okay. Uh, so, so, so uh, the Q-tending infinity is known, and it it is known that the limit does not exist, but there are finitely many subsequential limits. Mm -hmm. But uh, the end-ending infinity limit uh, is something that uh, bothers me right now. So that is what uh, one thing can be done. And of course, uh, anyway, these questions make sense over the other classical groups also. Uh, so yeah, so it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, also, we have also the, dealt with the case when m comma q is prime. Yeah, 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 yeah. That you are not saying anything. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't have a time. So yeah. So so just one uh, comment here that uh, so we have done everything for Q and M G C D is one, right? So the other case is remaining, of course. But then we have also done it for the following case that uh, M is a prime and Q is a power of M. Okay. So that is another mm -hmm. extreme case. So for example, what are squares in the characteristic two case, or what are cubes in the characteristic three case, right? Uh, in those cases, it is very interesting because there are no uh, conditions on the polynomial that turns up, but the, there are nice conditions that turns up with the partitions corresponding to the polynomials. So it's, it seems that if an alpha and a matrix has to be a mth power, then those partitions lambda f has to satisfy a very I mean, specific condition. Okay. Uh, although f does not have to satisfy any condition at all. Right? I see. Yeah, so th those hmm. are also there and uh, yeah, so those are also interesting. So then that looks like it's more pure combinatorics. You don't have to worry about the counting polynomials of different types. And so. Yeah, I mean, so it in that case probably the the unipotents are problem. So naturally it has to do with the partitions. Yeah, uh, because uh, right. semi simples so will be always like, uh, yeah co prime, so they will always survive in the image. Okay, so uh, are there any more questions from the rest of the audience? Oh, if, if not, I think we should all unmute our mics and uh, give a big hand to Ritu Gote, a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.